But Teal, what about the gay fish? You didn't tell us about the gay fish. Gay fish. Gay fish. Well, okay then, let's talk about the gay fish. Homosexual behavior is a very interesting beast, especially when it comes to the view of evolution. After all, what is the evolutionary advantage of being homosexual? You're not going to pass on your genes, ergo your genetic line dies. This is of no benefit to your genes that want to reproduce themselves. And yet, same-sex sexual behavior is something which can be viewed all throughout the animal kingdom. Now, you would have thought that if homosexuality had absolutely no benefit whatsoever and was in fact entirely detrimental to genes reproducing themselves, that this behavior would not exist. And this has led to numerous hypotheses, various ideas that attempt to explain how or why this behavior may continue to exist. For some explanations, it's simply down to social bonding, that the pleasurable experience that is sexual stimulation, that may simply be there as a means of strengthening social bonds. In other circumstances and species, it's hypothesized that it may be a form of social dominance. It could also work as a form of sexual practice for when those animals come of age and finally attract a mate for real. There's also some very interesting cases, such as in certain insect species, where males can indirectly inseminate females via forcefully mating with other males. In essence, the dominant male replaces the submissive male's sperm with his own. And in other cases, it may simply be that alleles that promote same-sex sexual behavior in one sex of a species is actually beneficial in the other sex, because it promotes behavior that isn't same-sex sexual behavior, and as such, those alleles are simply maintained by that selection. To make it ridiculously oversimplified, let's say there was one allele that that determined whether you're attracted to men or not. Obviously, this is not how sexuality works in humans, it is considerably more complicated than that, but just go with it for the sake of the oversimplified example. This allele that makes you sexually attracted to men would be very advantageous in women, because that allele would drive them towards having sex in a manner that is actually procreational. But if that allele manifests in a man and he's interested in having sex with men, well, that's the disadvantage. But what if it's a gene that's pleiotropic, it requires other genes in order to turn on? Well, in that case, straight men can carry it, but not be affected by it, allowing it to be reproduced. It could turn on in females, resulting in their sexual attraction to males, giving them that advantage. And then in the odd circumstance where that allele happens to work pleiotropically with other ones in a male, at that point it's just kind of, eh, it's a byproduct. For the most part it is a successful strategy, but every so often it just goes a bit wrong. Now, like I said, that is a gross oversimplification. We don't know if there is a gay gene, and the odds of such a complex behavior coming down to a single allele is quite unlikely. The odds are much better that it is something that is influenced by several genes, and then a degree of environmental stimulation on top of that, as is the case with most human behaviors. The closest that we've come to finding the gay gene, as it were, is finding several gene variants that appear at a higher frequency in homosexuals than heterosexuals. But then, of course, there's other explanations for the existence of homosexual behavior, such as non-adaptive explanations, such as simple mistaken identity, or the so-called prison effect, depriving individuals of members of the opposite sex, then goes on to promote same-sex sexual interactions. And that is what we're going to be looking at today. The absence of female conspecifics induces homosexual behavior in male guppies, otherwise known as THEY'RE TURNING THE FREAKING FISH GAY! It's quite a simple experiment, really. Guppies being group-living, fairly promiscuous fish, engage in two notable mating practices. The first is the fairly obvious display. This would be the males dancing around, showing off their colors and what strong swimmers they are, and nipping at competitive males, which is asserting their dominance as the alpha fish in the group. And the second method is the sneak copulation, which we've mentioned before, which is the male approaches the female, extends his gonopodium, and just tries to put it in the female without her noticing. And if all goes well, impregnate her, and then just swim away like nothing happened. And that method is very good for the beta or omega males in the group, because it obviously bypasses the need to confront the alpha fish of the group. 
a confrontation that they would surely lose. And intrasexual competition in guppies, that is male-male competition or female-female competition, takes place in various forms, some of which can include forced homosexual mounting, which tends to take place in these up-close display dances. And this experiment looks at the rate of these displays in either mixed groups of guppies or non-mixed groups of guppies. So for this, they're established as groups of ten individuals, either five males and five females, or ten males. They were all reared in juvenile tanks, and none of them had sexually reproduced before the experiment. Once the groups were established, they were left for 35 to 38 days, during which the young fish were able to fully mature, and then over the next ten weeks they were monitored, and the number of displays were counted. The individuals in these tanks would then be put into free swim tests. This was basically taking them out of their established tanks, putting them into new tanks with new unfamiliar fish, and seeing if they would display to them, or attempt sneak copulations. After doing this for a number of weeks, they reversed the housing. That is, half of the single-sex treatment males were put into mixed-sex tanks, and half of the mixed-sex tanks were put into single-sex tanks and then the displaying frequencies and sneak copulation attempts were measured using the same methodology as the previous. The results very much speak for themselves. Males that were kept in single-sex tanks developed more male-directed displays than did the males maintained in a mixed-sex environment. Most interestingly, this homosexual display tendency was maintained even when there were females present later on in the experimentation. There are, of course, several potential explanations for this pattern of sexual behaviour. The first is that the single-sex treatment subjects persisted in male-directed behaviour even into Phase 2 was simply that they still had access to other male fish and that they were male fish that they were familiar with as opposed to the female fish who were new. So there's a possibility that a degree of familiarity may be biasing the fish. Further to this, female guppies tend to be larger than male guppies, and as such the researchers have hypothesized that there may have been some degree of fear response from the males encountering these females for the first time, simply seeing them as larger guppies that would therefore potentially be a threat to them. And even further to that is that they may simply have not recognized the female male guppies as being a fish that they could actually engage in courtship with, their only sexual encounters up until that point obviously coming from other males. What is clear, however, is that the early environment that these fish were kept in has had a knock-on effect on their sexual interactions later down the line. Another fish that periodically exhibits homosexual behaviour is a close relative of the guppy, known as the molly, but they do so for a very different reason. There's an interesting phenomenon that a lot of animals engage in, human beings included, known as mate poaching. It's a form of mate choice copying. And basically what it is, is Participant 1 sees Participant 2 engaging in some sort of mating ritual or displaying behaviour that is successful towards Participant 3, and thus Participant 1 sees Participant 2 and thinks, ha, huh, they must have something really good going for them if that other participant has willingly said yes to them. So I am also going to say yes. It somewhat explains why in humans, for instance, married men are actually more desirable to all women than non-married men, with a sizable study finding that 90% of single women were interested in a man who they believed was married, but that went down to only 59% when they were told he was single. Knowing that someone is already successful when it comes to the mating game can be a very positive drive for that individual's future success as well. And that's where we get to the interesting case of the molly. In the molly, females that see males successfully displaying and courting other females instantly seem to regard that male as a better choice. However, they seem to have taken it one step further, and that is that mating behaviour by itself seems to have gained some sort of inherent positive signal value. In this study, homosexual behaviour increases male attractiveness to females. There was an interesting test done, where female mollies were initially shown videos of males. Some had their colours subdued by 50%, others had their colours increased by 50%. 
and perhaps rather unsurprisingly, the females preferred to associate more with the more colourful male. And this makes sense, the coloration of mollies is somewhat an indicator of their physical health. So it makes sense that the females would see these brighter coloured mollies and think, wow, that one must be really fit and healthy, I'm gonna go have his babies. And this pattern formed the control for later experimentation. In the second part of that test, the females were randomly assigned to one of three different treatments for a period of ten minutes. The first was an animation showing the drab and the colourful male swimming alongside another slightly larger and more colourful male model. The second was the drab male performing heterosexual behaviour with a model female, whereas the more colourful male was just swimming alongside the model female. Or three, the drab male performing homosexual behaviour with the model male and the more colourful male swimming alongside the model male. So basically what we're doing here is seeing whether or not we can boost up the drab male, the guy who is half as colourful as his rival. And the results are quite spectacular. After watching these video displays and then being once again offered the choice between the big bold 50% colour enhanced male or the drab boring 50% less colourful male, the results are quite spectacular. The drab male, who was not getting very much attention before at all from the females, after he's been witnessed engaging in either heterosexual sex or homosexual sex, it didn't really matter which, his numbers shot up. He received significantly more female attention, by proportion compared to the brightly coloured male. So it seems in a species where mate choice copying rules the roost, bisexuality is the way to go. The name of the game is simply be seen having sex so that you can have more sex, and homosexual sex absolutely fills that order. So there you go, gay fish. Or I suppose more accurately, bisexual fish. It can be environmentally influenced, and it can also confer an evolutionary advantage by increasing the likelihood of successful heterosexual sex. The more you know, I guess.